Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Climate Change and its Impact on Fruit and Vegetable Crops. My name is Margaret Land, editor of Fruit and Vegetable Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is brought to you by BASF, We Create Chemistry. And I'd like to thank the company for supporting this event and the industry. BASF is a leader in horticultural crop production and actively works to bring solutions to help its customers and address challenges in their operations. Before we get started, I'd like to take this time to run over a few housekeeping issues. If you have any technical problems during the presentation, don't hesitate to contact us through the chat function located on your control panel. We'll see what we can do at our end to help you out. There will be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to ask our speaker questions about his presentation. You can write your queries or comments in the question tab at any time during the presentation, and we'll make sure they're answered after Al has finished. As well, all webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email in the next day that will contain a link to a recording of today's presentation. For you social media gurus out there, feel free to tweet or post during the webinar using hashtag ClimateFB. Today's webinar will be presented by Al Douglas. Al is the director of the Ontario Centre for Climate Impacts and Adaptation uh, Resources, located at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. He has extensive experience in climate science, climate change impact, vulnerability and risk assessment, policy development and adaptation planning in natural resource sectors, and is a member of Canada's expert panel on climate change adaptation and resilience results. Today he's going to discuss climate change, its associated impacts on agriculture, and how growers can respond through adaptation. Thank you, Al, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It's, 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 uh, it's my, my pleasure. I really uh, appreciate these opportunities to speak to uh, different audiences to convey information about climate change uh, impacts and adaptation. It's, it's somewhat encouraging because it's it's likely that about 99% of you are either curious or interested in, in climate change, or maybe it's part of your uh, part of your job to, to tackle the issue. So what, what we're doing here is really expanding and encouraging the sort of action that we need in order to uh, respond to, to climate change. And we'll be focusing on, on climate change uh, impacts and, and adaptation. So over the next uh, probably about uh, 45 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is walk through uh, the slides and talk a little bit about uh, climate change itself. So what, do, what exactly are we seeing? Uh, what are, uh, you know, talk a little bit about some of the impacts and uh, some of the things that we're experiencing and how we feel climate change, how it affects us, and then uh, move into a discussion about adaptation. So what is it that we can do to respond to, to changing climate? Uh, and then uh, close with a few uh, with a few uh, key messages. I put this this uh, slide up as the as the starting slide. It's a it's a quote from an old colleague of mine from the uh, University of Guelph here in Ontario. And Barry Smith is uh, pretty pretty um, well known for his work on on climate change and, and agriculture. And the first part of the quote talks about how climate change kind of represents a threat to uh, food supplies globally. Um, and and it's I guess you you could likely even expand that statement to say that it's it's a real threat to economies around the world economies as as a whole for countries around the world. If you go to the go back to the the World Economic Forum that was held in Davos, Switzerland back in February, there was a significant amount of discussion about changing climate and the impact to economies. So we know that in in parts of the world, in most parts of the world, where where uh, you know food supply is a major part of the economy, it will be affected by climate change. And then even here, so in in, in Canada, you know winners and losers. But it, it in the end and in the long run, uh, a serious threat to to uh, production and productivity. And so we need to be able to kind of take to, take stock of what those sorts of challenges are and, and respond through uh, adaptation. A quick word about who we are. I think in in Canada, we um, people refer to us as as kind of a, a boundary organization, one that kind of sits on the on the on the border between science and decision making or science and policy. 
some people refer to us as as uh, amplifier organizations it's likely because we we um, package and present research and information and science particularly on climate change impacts and adaptation but we also assist in the development of uh, uh, different uh, tools and, and strategies and we work with a variety of different partners as you can see from this slide uh, we work across uh, sectors we work across uh, uh, different uh, government departments provincial federal um, departments and work with a variety of different stakeholders to develop uh, climate change adaptation plans and strategies and uh, give insights on how to mobilize those those plans and those uh, strategies and we've been around since 2001 here at uh, at the university so there's there's no doubt that things are changing um you know it's it's uh, it's it, the the observations of 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 climate change and the way that we experience and feel climate change is fairly significant and is well studied and uh and discussed a lot around the world there's there's lots of indicators that that show uh, changes in climate it's not just the temperature change we're seeing uh, declines in in Arctic e uh, sea ice extent. We're seeing, um, you know, more heat uh, content in the in the oceans. We're seeing the retreat of glaciers. Um, you know, all of this combined or driven by changes to uh, surface air air temperatures around the globe. And so, as a result of of these sorts of uh, changes, we feel the the the, the pain of of uh, of of extreme events like wildfires or or of, of very weather variability perhaps in terms of drought, we see the uh, extremes of, of, of storms and of uh, sea level rise. And uh, it affects not just, uh, it affects kind of all aspects of society. It affects our communities, it affects us as, as uh, individuals, as homeowners, and it affects uh, built systems as well as natural systems. So broadly speaking, we're feeling these sorts of impacts uh, around the globe. And if you were to dig into the temperature records that from stations that we have set up around the country most of them operated by environment and climate change canada you would see that if you track back over the last say 60 or 70 years you would see that the average uh, air temperatures have increased in canada by about 1.6 degrees celsius and that's all relative to uh, a baseline period from 1961 to 1990 and so it's important to to understand that as we as we kind of measure changing climate we compare it to um, usually to 20 or 30 year periods that's climate anything less than that is considered weather and there is a difference we need to recognize that but suffice to say that that you know we're up about a degree and a half or 1.6 degrees celsius globally we sit at about 0.8 degrees Celsius increase over that roughly that same um, period of record, maybe a little bit longer. And so another message to get from this graph is that Canada is actually warming it at twice the rate than, than the rest of the world. So the changes here are quite significant and we, we have a very, uh, there's a bit of variability across the country. Of, of course, we have regional differences in how climate change is, is unfolding. Similar uh, observations when it comes to precipitation, uh, although we don't see um, um, a uniform or common trend across the, the country, you can certainly see from this graph where there are uh, locations that are experiencing uh, statistically significant, those are the shaded arrows, uh, increases or decreases in precipitation. This is annual uh, precipitation levels. And you can also detect where there are uh, drier periods, where they're do, where they're experiencing less precipitation, mostly in the in the in the prairie provinces. So that you look at the areas in in along the coast and in southern BC, uh, the Great Lakes area along the St. Lawrence River and up through uh, Atlantic Canada, some uh, statistically significant increases in in precipitation. But what this doesn't tell you is how the precipitation is falling. Uh, the intensity levels of precipitation, uh, how frequently those are occurring, and the length of stretches in between uh, precipitation. So these are just simple annual uh, trends. So it tells you a little bit of information, but it doesn't tell you the, the, the complete story that we have. And you need to dig in a little bit more uh, regionally to, to, to understand those, uh, those averages. And it's also fair to say that as the as the if you look at kind of temperature uh, distributions or shifts to these 
uh, average these temperature anomalies uh, over 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 different periods you can see that as the average shifts so do the kind of the the uh, the tail ends of this sort of distribution and so you know there's a lot of discussion lately about how um, the extent to which we uh, associate extreme weather uh, to, to to climate change and you can see that it is uh, if you just look at the simple kind of temperature distribution curves you can see that it is uh, there is a, a larger area, meaning that it's more likely that we would see those sorts of extremes um, as time goes on and into the future when it comes to um, to climate. We so all of that information that I just presented is is in fact historic. Those are trends um, uh, trends in temperature and precipitation, and so there's there's no doubt you know from those when you look at them, there's no question that that things are are changing and they come from measured uh, records. But everyone wants to know about what is in store for the future. Uh, we we want to know kind of how things are expected to change and over what time frames and and uh, you know like how bad can it get and that sort of thing. And so we look to the to the the, the Canadian uh, uh, um, climate modeling contingent, and we also look to other global uh, climate modeling groups around the around the world for these sorts of projections of both temperature and precipitation. Uh, you can you can uh, get projections of other climate indices uh, as well, but these are just a, a, a sampling of of uh, the temperature projections for Canada along the top four uh, grid cells, and the projections of precipitation change along the bottom four. Now, a couple of other things to note about this is that these um, projections go towards the middle of the century. So again, we we project into uh, 20 or 30 year time slices. This one is towards the middle of the century. And this is all, the slide doesn't mention it, but this is also under a fairly intensive uh, greenhouse gas emission scenario. So if you just look at the graphs, you can tell that from season to season, which is another interesting thing to note about the projections of change, is that we can expect to see larger increases in temperature in the winter months and in the autumn months in, in Canada and less so in the uh, spring and summer months. Similarly, for um, for precipitation, you can see we expect to have drier periods, especially in, in parts of BC and southern Alberta, in the summer months and in the uh, spring months when compared to the autumn and the, and, the, and the winter. So again, you know, these sorts of projections are helpful to, to kind of paint the picture of the direction that we're, that we're going into the future. Um, we have climate modelers in Canada who who produce these sorts of results, uh, as well as the uh, as the as the federal government. And as I go on to the next slide, you can see just another example of a, of the type of graphic display that we can produce. This, these maps are actually a little bit better, but they only tell you the the kind of the annual temperature change. So again, if you look at the average, we're expected to increase in the range of of uh, three to five degrees Celsius for Canada uh, into the towards the middle of the century. And precipitation changes in the ranges of about five to fifteen percent on average for for the whole of the of the country uh, into the future. Um, people are often curious and, and they ask about um, kind of how much confidence we have in these sorts of projections, and the science continues to improve. And but there are some um, there are some features, some indices that that uh, we have a bit more confidence in as we make these sorts of projections. Um, you can see the the graphic shown here. We have more certainty normally with with um, uh, different indices that are associated with temperature change. Those ones have a little bit more certainty. Um, there's a lot more variability when it comes to precipitation, so it's more difficult to do. And and the 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 certainty levels are are um, are, are are better with with kind of larger events or, or average events over over larger time periods, we have more confidence in those. As you can see from the slide, it's 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 fairly difficult to make um, uh, accurate projections of of uh, convective type of storms like ice storms or increases in wind um, with respect to when you when you try to model climate change. So we take this into account and we kind of communicate the um, the confidence levels that we have or the certainty levels that we have with the with the with the projections. And <clears throat> this um, the the graph here shows that you know some of these things when you look at the the the, the top impacts that we have on this list, uh, the things that are have already happened or are happening, uh, it, it's likely that those things will continue into the future. 
uh, to a larger extent or, or perhaps more, more often uh, if they are individual events. So we've got pretty good certainty in, uh, uh, that, that those things are going to occur into the future and, and probable uh, among those events listed uh, in the bottom. But when it comes to how we you know, look into the future to be able to take sort of a risk management approach to, to uh, extreme weather and, and climate change, um, what we do know is how we've experienced these sorts of extremes or these sorts of risks based on uh, the past. And that's a key component of, of adaptation planning is knowing kind of the, the limits of your systems, the state of your systems, uh, and, and knowing how they've responded in the past to these sorts of extremes. It's a really good uh, bit of um, kind of um, thinking that, that we encourage people to go through when they, when they try to uh, understand how uh, they will be affected by future uh, changes in, in climate. The data sources that I showed a, a couple of uh, slides ago, um, you know, there's an increasing demand for this sort of climate data and information, and the federal government is is taking steps to um, to um, open the Canadian Centre for Climate Services, uh, and there are also another um, uh, a number of other climate data providers across the country. This is one example that I put up um, where. The, the folks from Risk Sciences International have developed this web interface to, um, to uh, lend information about uh, changing climate, both historic trends and future projections. And it's really all about accessing the information and the data that is pertinent to you. So for the, the agriculture community, it might be things like uh, crop heat units are growing degree days uh, or the, the length of the frost free season. Um, and apply that to decision making, specific decision making within your your sector or your your field of, of study. So RSI is a private sector organization, and they have developed this uh, really fancy uh, web uh, portal, web interface, and with a username and password, you can access some of the information inside there, and um, to help support your uh, decision making in your in your uh, local context. So generally speaking, we see. Uh, these sorts of impacts over over Canada. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing losses of permafrost in in the north. We're seeing uh, there's good records to show that um, the freeze up dates are occurring later in the year, and the break up dates uh, for ice are occurring earlier in the year. We're seeing earlier runoff from different uh, snowpacks or or ice uh, areas. Um, and we're seeing declines in the in the amount of stream flow that are available later into the into the summer months. We're seeing record of earlier budding of trees. We see there is record of earlier ca calling of frogs and toads. Uh, and um, and you know the 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 challenges associated with being able to predict the weather and travel on the land uh, from the perspectives of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Is uh, significantly uh, changing and, and jeopardized as you know a, a key part of their of, of their culture. So the the impacts are very broad. They're they're very um, broad across the country and um, and and quite uh, quite significant. And so if we were to take those sorts of impacts and then look at where we have agricultural production across the country, one could um, begin to map over what those uh, climate changes are and what the impacts are to a more specific region, a more specific agricultural or, or, or production region within the country. <clears throat> and that's pretty important. It's, it's important to be able to look not just at the, at, the, at the broad trends or the national trends, the, a lot of the stuff that I've presented so far, it really makes a lot of sense to be able to dig deeper into the data to show uh, to, to give some indication of what that means in 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 your uh, in your region of the of the of the province or the or the territory, and so, and it also makes sense to look at what what the what the um, how each of the commodities or or each of the the uh, production systems will be affected by climate change because each feels and experiences climate different, right? They all have different. Uh, 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 thresholds or they all have different vulnerabilities they all experience climate change in different ways and it's again as I say 
it's 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 pretty important to be able to look at what your priorities are as a as a region uh, and do that sort of assessment of vulnerability and risk using the climate information in order to determine how at risk you are into the future or what sorts of opportunities might arise uh, into the future. And some have even gone so far as to do some translations into economic terms. So if we know the value of a certain uh, commodity, we can look at changes to uh, levels of, of, of productivity um, in those areas and then and then translate that into economic terms. Um, sometimes these estimates are, are, are crude, but they're still kind of get you in the ballpark of, of you know, kind of how how we are expected to feel these sorts of changes uh, into the into the future. If we look specifically at at agriculture, we can take those sorts of climate hazards that I have listed on the left hand side, and we can map them over into these sorts of impacts that we're experiencing. So the increases in in temperature, changes in in precipitation, uh, extreme weather, uh, in some cases sea level rise in the in the coastal areas, these translate into uh, risks and opportunities. Longer growing seasons, for example, uh, we see a, a shift in the in cropping patterns. We see shifts in um, the 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 presence and abundance of pests and diseases in certain areas. Um, we see examples of, of uh, water stresses, both excess and, and shortages in different parts of the, of the country. Infrastructure is an interesting one because it, it, in, in my mind, it affects both uh, farm level infrastructure, so um, smaller scale, but it's also, in my mind, it's also important to farmers to know that they have uh, resilient infrastructure surrounding them, maybe under the responsibility of uh, municipalities or regions or uh, or unorganized townships and that, that sort of thing where where you know that that infrastructure is important uh, for the for the egg community and there will be losses and, and gains of of, uh, of both agri of uh, agricultural lands across the country so I guess it's important to, to, to note a, um, from this slide is that is that climate change looks and feels different it, it includes both the long-term changes to average temperature and precipitation, the one stuff that I talked about at the beginning, it also includes uh, examples of extreme weather. But there's the kind of the, the in-between, and, 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 and I call it variability, the highs and the lows, and we see a lot of that already. We see, we see a lot of that, uh, we, we, do, we, we already experience the highs and lows and we recognize that, but it's also the fact that climate, in the context of changing climate, is the fact that we'll continue to see those sorts of highs and lows and possibly to greater highs or greater lows and, and possibly more often. And, and, and that taxes the systems that we have in place. It, 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 uh, it kind of taxes our ability to maintain or grow uh, production in, our, in the different, uh, different regions of, of Canada. It's important also to mention <clears throat> that there are positive and negative impacts. There will be opportunities that will arise as a result of, of, of climate change. Um, you know, we're, we're, we see, uh, you know, the, the examples that are listed on the left-hand side, increased uh, productivity with, with warmer temperatures. So we have possibilities of growing new crops uh, or different crops in, 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 new, in new regions. We have the potential for longer growing seasons. We have the potential for more uh, heat that's available in certain areas. We see the potential to have longer periods uh, with, without frost, um, accelerated maturation rates. All of these things stand as, as opportunities um, and they are viewed along the lines, uh, you know, at the same time as we view the risks. We, we see the challenges that are listed on, on the right hand side, extreme heat, uh, potentially soil erosion, pests, um, you know, moisture stress and, and droughts and things like that. But ultimately, when we, when we, if we, if we want to seize the opportunities and if we want to manage the risks associated with the negative impacts, it requires adaptation. It requires us to take measures and and either become more resilient or take measures to. Uh, take advantage of those opportunities that are going to present themselves. But you won't know what they are unless you're informed by 
um, uh, information about climate change data, uh, risk assessment or opportunity assessment processes, and uh, and what ultimately can be done in order to to do to seize those opportunities. What are the options? What are the opportunities? So we we look at both the positive and negative impacts, and we try to develop responses in order to uh, to um, to try to sort of seize those uh, seize those opportunities and manage the risks. A little earlier, I, I talked about being able to get down to to, to finer regions, pro provinces, and territories uh, levels in order to do these sorts of assessment. The same thing can be said about within specific regions. Um, and so, for for the different, and again, you know, in reference to the to the to the specific uh, commodities, the specific fruit or vegetables that are being grown in in different regions of 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 the, the provinces and territories in Canada, you take a look at. It, it makes sense to look at those different agricultural re regions. What are the main um, um, areas of, of production in in those in those different regions, and then take a look at overlay the climate information or the climate change data that you have, in order to look at how those changes are unfolding in your in your specific uh, area in your specific region. The 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 um, the the sources of information that we have the climate change uh, data is sometimes not at a scale or f from some sources it's not at a scale that is appropriate for this sort of much more regional decision making that would go on and so we what we try to do is is uh, downscale some of those global climate models in order to get regional climate data um, to, to be able to detect those sorts of differences uh, within smaller areas. Now, it does a better job at resolving those kind of large uh, landscape features, things like mountainous regions or uh, um, um, changes in terrain or even larger water bodies like the Great Lakes. The regional climate models do a better job of resolving those, those influences and uh, ultimately um, how, they affect, uh, how they affect climate. But, what it doesn't do is give you a better. Uh, people sometimes get fooled because they think that it's a it's better. They have better confidence in the numbers that are being produced from regional climate models. It may not necessarily be the case. So you just you have to be careful when you're looking at that sort of data. But suffice to say, you can get information at a finer scale to help support decision making in each of these uh, each of these different regions, as, as we have in the example for for BC. I want to roll through a couple of examples of of, uh, of of this sort of climate information that can be helpful to support decision making, adaptation decision making in, in different regions. I've got uh, the next five slides show different regions of Canada and some projections that have been made with respect to the length of the growing season. This is some work that was done by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, a few years ago, and it's um, it's a, it's it's a very interesting way to present the information and very very helpful when it comes to decision making as you can see the the if you look closely you can see the scale or the size of the grid scales or the grid cells is fairly uh, small and so this is probably some regional climate modeling that that uh, that was introduced for for the area so we start with BC and um we, I don't want to present numbers a lot of numbers to you but I guess suffice to say that what what the modelers have done here is that they have taken they they've looked at the the area within the region that has certain uh, growing season lengths in days and they've mapped that out they've created the map to show that sort of and that's the baseline and the agricultural extents are listed are shown by the the dark black lines and so what they do is they uh, introduce a climate change scenario into this sort of modeling, and they project into the future the changes in the um, the 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 area of land that will have these different growing season lengths. So, for example, if you look at BC cur at current, there's about um, 7.6. The data shows that there's about 7.6 percent of the land mass. Under the baseline scenario, 7.6% of the land mass has a growing season length of greater than 170 days. Modeling into the future, into that time frame, into the into the future, the 2020s is the period that they're looking at. It'll increase to it's projected to increase to about 16%, so roughly doubling into the into this uh, into this next 30-year uh, time period. Similarly, 
you can look at the the other uh, the low end of the scale as as an example, and you can and the the current area of the province that has growing season lengths of less than 100 days is at about 34 percent and into the future that's expected to decline to about 10 percent or roughly a third of, of what it is now so that's how they that's how they're presenting this this sort of uh, sort of information so those those are the data for for british columbia if you look at the at the prairie region you can see uh, fairly large increases in, in that kind of uh, swath across the south of these of the provinces. Uh, large areas changing in in Saskatchewan and in uh, and in Manitoba. And uh, again, looking at the the map of Ontario, you can see that from the southwest of the of the province right through to the to the eastern parts, large increases of that greater than 170. Uh, um, day growing season and if we look into Quebec uh, similarly you can see the changes to the growing season length uh, modeling and, pro and projections out into the future again it's interesting to note because it almost looks like isotherm lines on a map and you can see that as you go into the future the the lines just continue to move further and further further and further north and finally, the map of uh, of Atlantic Canada. So all of this is is on the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, website. You can access this sort of information. And they not only do they have, I've, I mean, I've showed this, this, the slides of the length of the growing season, but you can also uh, access maps just like this that show effective uh, growing degree days. And they also have maps and projections of moisture deficits. So th this information is is really helpful. It's it's very good to kind of get broad scale, you know, a broad scale view of how things are expected to change. You can get into into finer detail if you get, um, you know, get a take a closer look at the maps or even access the raw data. Um, for me, when I looked over the data, the interesting thing was, and and the largest changes were not about the the darker shades of brown it was not there wasn't as significant a change in the uh in the in the in the high end of of growing season length but there was much more change in the low end of growing season length so uh so for example in british columbia it's cut to about a third the 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 uh, the gro where the growing season is less than 100 days it's cut to about a third um in uh in the prairies that number drops in in half it goes from uh, 14 to about uh, seven percent in ontario it again it cuts in about half in quebec it cuts to about 45 percent and in atlantic canada it cuts down uh in, in about half again and so the real big gains are in the kind of the low end of that sort of growing season length which is which is quite uh, quite fascinating so generally, the uh, you know there, it's still um, at, at times can be a challenging discussion uh, climate change with with the agriculture community. Um, and what's what's interesting is that as, as we've sh seen just from those maps that are shown, the impacts will affect different parts of Canada uh, differently. Um, there's good um, information out there that show that you know the prairies are you know where there's large large swaths of agricultural land are likely to be affected uh, most significantly, and some big challenges into the future when it comes to moisture or uh, or drought stress. Um, and so again, looking at at how this plays out regionally is is fairly important. And I move into a, a couple of examples of. A couple of examples of of, uh, of extreme weathers, and and um, you know that I that I pulled from from the literature. Um, when we when we when we think about how um, crops can can be affected in any given year from extreme weather, it can be enormously significant. It can affect the economy of regions, especially within a given sector, quite significantly, and. Um, you know this example from British Columbia and their desire to to to, to really uh, grow the, uh, the the agricultural economy in, in British Columbia. Events like this can have significant uh, challenges from for in in any given year. Examples of from 2009, 
uh, where there was a, issues with the uh, with the with the fruit fly, and uh, in 2006, heavy rainfall causing significant damages in uh, southwestern BC in the Delta area, and 2012 drought in the in the Peace River region, and so these, uh, you know, these some of these. Um, some of these uh, crops are are more sensitive to changing climate and certain climatic conditions than others. So some are are kind of inherently more or less resilient, and some of them will be affected much more significantly. So extreme weather can have a, a huge impact. Similarly, in 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 Ontario, um, you know we had we had uh, here in Ontario we had a, a, a really really wet year uh, last year. There was just enormous amounts of rain. Which, which not only delayed kind of uh, planting in different areas, but it also uh, flooded the crops a little later on and was followed up by, by continuous rain and, and extreme weather. Large parts of the, of the province, especially eastern Ontario and in the Holland Marsh area of Ontario, were flooded with enormous amounts of, of, of rain. And so when you look at the apple crops, uh, you know, the, the you know, significant challenges in those, in those very, very wet years. Now, Interestingly, when you compare this to the way that things were in Ontario in 2016, it's almost the exact opposite. And this is the point that I made earlier about about uh, variability in the system: is that how how can it be so dry in 2016 and then one year later be so extraordinarily uh, wet? Here in um, in uh, again in 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 southern Ontario and in parts of south uh, and uh, uh, southeastern Ontario, um, minimal amounts of rain and precipitation uh, through the through the months of April, uh, May, June, and July, uh, and 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 additional costs in order to replace that that rainfall irrigation and the, all of the measures that had to be taken in order to irrigate where possible these areas to maintain production levels to save the uh, you know the the, the kind of the uh, the, the bottom line of some of these farms, the effort was enormous in order to irrigate. And so, you know, and, 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 and the ground was so hardened that when the rain did fall, it would fall on, on a ground that was not able to absorb the moisture and recharge. It was it, just a lot of it was lost in, in runoff. So pretty, um, pretty significant uh, challenges there. So we changed gears a bit and, and, and we also know that, that changing climate can make um, can make uh, the conditions conducive for the movement uh, and uh, kind of um, abundance of, of pests uh, and, and diseases as well. I don't have diseases listed on here, but it's it's in the it's in the same category. There's good modeling work. This came out of uh, Agriculture and Agri Food Canada back in 2006, where they combined uh, bioclimate models and scenarios of of, uh, of, uh, of climate change, and they looked at how um, the, the suitability of specific locations for uh, the movement or survival and reproduction of these different critters uh, in different parts of, of Canada and measured their uh, the potential for their distribution, their movement or survival within a within a region or movement to new regions. And, and of course, this is this is important information because we we if we think about adaptation, what is it that it looks like in this instance? Well, it's earlier detection. It's um, you know, targeted intervention, it's, con it's containment or control or, e or even eradication. So this is, this is some really uh, interesting research that helps paint the picture about other kind of impacts that we could experience in the, in the, uh, in the ag, ag sector. So we'll change gears now and talk a bit about, uh, about uh, adaptation which is is kind of the other side of the response to climate change. There's a lot in the media lately that talks about uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the, the a national uh, carbon pricing strategy and and uh, um, you know what we need to do in order to reduce emissions, which is which is really, really critical. But for this conversation, it's about the impacts of climate change and what we can do now to look at at, uh, at the risks and or take advantage of the opportunities. And adaptation looks and feels different in different regions of, of, of Canada and around the world. To some cities, it's about green roofs to control precipitation uh, or to, key, to, to help with cooling. In some areas, it's about cooling centers to protect vulnerable populations. Uh, on the bottom right, it's those uh, it's those fancy devices that can be installed in 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 the basement of homes to to prevent um, sewage from entering back up into your basement when there's recharge from heavy amounts of stormwater, or water capture, 
uh, polymers in, in concrete to, to prevent uh, freeze-thaw cycling, and uh, the, the, the good old Dutch in the middle who have learned to kind of live with water and have begun to build institutions and, and uh, schools and shopping malls inside these floating pavilions in, in order to deal with sea level rise and, and flooding. So it varies by region and, and adaptation varies according to specific uh, the hazards that you're, that you're dealing with. I think along the way we've we've done and, and especially the agricultural community who are in the face of of, of extreme weather and changing climate uh, all the time there's been a good uh, you know when it comes to the amount of adaptation that's happened much of it has been incremental adaptation uh, there's been a bit of systems adaptation but at times it may require us to be thinking outside those limits and and think about what sorts of transformational changes would be required in order to um, uh, in order to maintain resilience, maintain uh, productivity in different regions of of Canada, and that's those are those are those are fairly big steps, and it requires us to get kind of outside the box uh, a little bit. Adaptation is also very much a process. It starts with raising awareness. You move into uh, you know the collection of information, which supports the assessment of vulnerabilities and and risks. And then this stage that is developing adaptation measures and implementing those measures and then learning about the effectiveness of those and and how we uh, how you know what we need to be doing differently or what sort of new science can enter into the decision making process what new information do we have and there are other groups uh, around the country similar to ours these are examples of other kind of boundary organizations that, that exist across the country that can help access resources to provide advice or insights or to help walk through those different processes uh, related to uh, to changing climate so there's a few of these organizations that are that are our colleagues my colleagues across the country that do this similar uh, sort of work there's also good evidence of, of, of how adaptation is actually happening uh, at, the, at the farm level. We see, if you took a look at this left, list on the left-hand side, I would imagine that many of you are familiar with these things. And so it, it, a lot of it is the, the things that we know about or things that we have been doing, it's just in at, possibly at different scales, possibly at different time intervals, possibly yet at more efficient use of these sorts of, of examples of adaptation that are already occurring uh, uh, on the at the at the farm at the farm level and 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 appropriate for your region and your uh, type of, of farming that you that you do the other side of the equation is to is in order for, is to have uh, governments so so federal governments and, and provincial and territorial governments to have support of uh, supportive programming. This is an example came out of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency that was really encouraging these sorts of innovative approaches to uh, adaptation at, at the farm level. And, and as I understand it, this program was fairly successful and yielded a number of different innovations that helped uh, build resilience within uh, agricultural systems. Another example in, in on the on the policy side, this is a one of those pieces that is, is is again responsible. If we want to encourage adapting to climate change at the farm level, uh, we need these sorts of supportive policies to be in place at, at regional levels, at provincial or, or federal levels. I pulled this example from uh, from British Columbia that was a, a book, uh, an action plan that was put out a number of years ago, but still stands as a good example of how they've approached this strategically, not done willy nilly, but rather to, uh, approached in a strategic way where they establish goals, uh, talk about the strategies to help accomplish those, uh, meet those goals, and then the actions that they, that they, the, the tangible activities that they will undertake in order to, to get there. It's a great example, and, and the support of policy really does uh, enable adaptation uh, at, at, uh, at, a, at different levels. So if, if we think, and, and if there is a, a, you know, a discussion about what, what um, supports adapting to climate change or what stands in the way of adapting to climate change there's a number of different studies that have been done to look at these sorts of things and you know from our perspective what we want to do is try to capitalize on those things or, or create more of those enablers and really understand what the barriers are and take steps to break them break them down uh, or overcome those if we're going to have good adaptation um, ac across the across the across the country 
just want to close uh, with an example of some uh, assessment work, some risk assessment work that we did here in Ontario we a couple of years ago with support from our provincial ministry of agriculture we developed this uh, climate and agriculture assessment framework that strove to look at um, to inform policy and program and management choices and prepare for the impacts of climate change and it was had a, a variety of audiences um, but it was really a um, it was it was it was built to assess baseline and future risks, agroclimatic risks and, and opportunities. And again, as I've been saying throughout the presentation, this framework was an example of of one that was applied to a specific commodity or production system in a specific region of the province. And we developed these sorts of um, these climate data sets and looked at the decadal risks and opportunities. Uh, out into towards the middle of the century, and we ended up developing not just that that plethora of of climate data information for both these regions, but also what could be done at the farm level to adapt to, to these sorts of changes, as well as what the province uh, was hoping to hear with respect to um, kind of policy insights or or advice. We used a, an existing tool. We were lucky enough to find the land suitability rating system that had climate as a component of it, and we were able to uh, alter that climate component to see how the suitability of the land would change and, and how that ultimately would affect productivity uh, into the future based on what we knew about uh, production levels uh, in the past. And so we developed, uh, as I had mentioned before, the, the, the kind of one of the primary audiences were the policy folks, and we developed these policy briefs. Uh, in order to give some insights about what would be needed, and, the, and it's important to note too that this was not; these briefs were not just for the agriculture ministry; they were also for uh, for those who have have, uh, have control or, or purview over water, uh, over land use, uh, over over forestry. Those those uh, different uh, provincial departments. So, uh, you know, an example of a, of a of a transferable, translatable assessment framework that could be applied in in in, in different regions of Canada to understand uh, baseline and, and future and future risks, and a great example of 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 a translation of science into into management options and into policy at all three realms of of uh, uh, associated or needed for decision making there. So. I'll just conclude with a, with a couple of, of key messages. The, the fact that, that you know climate change is, is here. We, we've got proof of, of the sorts of changes. It's changing uh, quickly, and it's pervasive. It spreads across all sectors of the economy and, and in different parts of Canada. And there are risks and opportunities for the ag sector. But in order for us to capitalize on the opportunities and manage the risks, we need that sort of tools and information and data. And all of this stuff goes towards Kind of building the capacity to to respond to to changing climate, and it's it's adaptation in the context of low carbon futures. As our as our economy transfers over to one that is uh, less fossil fuel in, intensive, we think about adaptation in that context of of, of low carbon uh, futures, and it is certainly a it's a it's a manageable issue, but. Um, we need this. This the adaptation is important for us to sustain or enhance levels of, of production, uh, agricultural production in different parts of the country. So with that, I'll close and say uh, thank you very much for your for your attention and your time. Uh, thank you, Al. Uh, just a quick reminder: uh, if you have any questions or comments, we'd like them to uh, you to write them in the question tab and we'll make sure they're answered uh, um, in, in queue. So, to begin, um, in many cases in Ontario, uh, potato planting is about one week behind schedule this spring. So, based on your uh, presentation, this would be due to weather and not climate change? Yeah. You, you would, yeah, absolutely. You would call in in any given year what you experience as weather, but what you take from it is is that what if this is likely to continue into the future, or what do the projections say about this sort of uh, later 
later season, later start to the season? And, and how am I dealing with it right now? And is that the right way to deal with it? And what is it that I could do differently in order to, you know, deal with this sort of more regular occurrence into the future? Okay. So uh, there was a discussion about the three types of adaptation. Uh, and then there was a mention that we'd mostly seen incremental adaptation. Uh, with transformational adaptation, what would that entail? Yeah, it's in my mind, transformational adaptation is much bigger. It's much bigger picture thinking. We we um, we experienced this in some of the work that we did in in Ontario. We we did those that sort of risk assessment up in the in the north in the Great Clay Belt um, of of Ontario. We looked at Ontario, and, but it stretches over into Quebec, and there was a real um, interest and real curiosity about how climate change might support more agriculture in the north in that area, and there had been agriculture there before, but the 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 land the landscape is not conducive it's not ready or prepared for farming and so if we were going to do that what would we need to do in order to transform the landscape into one that is conducive to farming so you know there's all kinds of 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 of, of kind of small scale and and medium scale and large scale activities that have to happen there needs to be supportive policy in place there needs to be efforts to even attract people to buy the land in order to to do the farming up there and so it's much kind of larger scale bigger thinking types of activities when it comes to transformational change okay so we have another question uh, do you have any insights specific to climate change impacts on greenhouse agriculture would you consider the application of greenhouse technology as a form of adaptation? I, th I, th I think it is. I think it is as long as the energy sources are are ones that are appropriate in the in the context of us wanting to make sure that we're reducing emissions. Um, in, in essence, if we have if we have more heat, uh, there may be some additional protection that's provided by by greenhouses. Uh, we also have the ability to to kind of uh, extend the season in in some cases using greenhouse technology. So I think as a as a as a form of adaptation, I think it uh, I, I think it stands as a as a as a good example. I don't have specific references or research off the top of my head, but I'm sure some have looked at how uh, the use of greenhouses can support, especially weather variability in times where we have less control over the lot of uh, over. Um, um, you know the way that things are playing out in in the on the landscape and have the ability to control that with infrastructure um, Where can producers go to access uh, climate data uh, and more information? Hmm. Uh, it, it, it can come from a, a variety of different sources um, the, the federal government as I said is trying to do uh, what they can to have more of this available for different audiences across the country. Sometimes provinces have uh, access to this sort of information. Um, the slide that I showed of of groups just like ours, these these boundary organizations, they often are because they work in the field of, of climate change impacts and adaptation. Sometimes exclusively, they have access to the information, or they produce it themselves. PKIC, uh, the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium in BC. Uh, has climate modelers on staff and they 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 do this they produce this kind of data uh, uranos in uh, quebec produces this 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 climate information so they have modeling capability there so it it really depends on what region you you look at in in canada uh, but those different organizations can provide good uh, good insights on on where you can get the data if not right directly from them okay thanks um, are there any statistics from the crop insurance companies about increasing damage and payouts? That's a good question. I I I I don't have uh, much information about. I mean, they don't. They they generally don't. They, they don't. They don't break the data down uh, into into fine detail. But what I what I do see is. I compare the um, amount of um, 
I, I compare the the challenges that the that the um, that the insurance industry writ large is is facing when it comes to changing climate. I mean, there's lots of information that that shows how uh, reinsurance as well as insurance companies are feeling this sort of pain as a result of an increase in the extremes of, of weather, not just in Canada, but around the globe. Their business case depends on one where they can bring in enough money with premiums to pay out uh, from for claims. And, and they've, in, you know, in many instances over the last number of years, they haven't been able to do that. So their business case is kind of wrong, but they're also taking steps to try to 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 ass, do a better job of assessing risk at at local levels so that they can set premiums accordingly i suppose and they can and they're also taking steps to encourage or incent measures that are more resilient um, so we know a lot about what's going on in the property and liability insurance sector but i don't know as much about crop insurance but i'm i'm curious about that i'd like to i'd like to learn a bit more about that to see um, kind of how things are unfolding, if they're unfolding in a similar way to the, to the property and liability insurance. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so I just wanted to provide a quick reminder. All webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email tomorrow that will contain a link to recording of today's presentation. So don't worry if you've missed anything. Uh, you will be getting uh, something tomorrow. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Al Douglas for taking the time to share his expertise expertise with us today. Um, I'd also like to thank BASF for sponsoring this webinar and helping provide this information to attendees. BASF, We Create Chemistry, would also like to extend its thanks to today's presenter and to attendees for their participation. BASF focuses on the long-term well-being of every part of agriculture for more than 100 years the company has been working together with grower customers to develop innovative solutions for their farms. Please visit agsolutions.ca slash horticulture to explore what BASF horticulture products have to offer for the 2018 season. BASF will continue to introduce innovative solutions, including new insect management tools for the future. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful afternoon.